Shapes of Orbitals is actually quite easy for most of them. Uh, it's, it's pretty standard, so we just need to remember the shape. Then when they ask us questions involving this, it's pretty straightforward, correct? Because hardly we have any variations involving shapes of orbitals. So S subshell, there's only one orbital. S orbital is spherical. So we just draw a circle, correct? I just put an axis. In chemistry, usually we don't really, we're not, we're not so strict, all right? In chemistry, we're not so strict about the direction of the axis. But typically, left and right will be the x-axis. Up and down will be the z-axis. In and out will be the y-axis. I think in physics, maybe they are a bit more particular in terms of the relative direction of my x, y, z axis. But in chemistry, we're not so, not so particular about it. So uh, you just stick to whatever your school is using. But typically, what we will do is x, and, x axis is left and right, z is up and down, y is in and out. And I just need to draw a circle to represent your s orbital. s orbital will be spherical in terms of shape. And when the n number increases, we know that your electron is located further away from the nucleus. So what this will mean is the orbital size must be bigger and bigger, correct? If you're in 1s on the first principal quantum shell, if I were to locate this electron, now this electron must be closer to the nucleus. So maybe I find the electron here. And the nucleus obviously is here, the origin is here. So if you're in n equals to 2, if you're in a 2s orbital, then I will be able to locate this electron further away from the nucleus. So this electron here from the nucleus is further away from this electron from the nucleus because this is in the second shell, this is in the first shell. Of course, in n equals to 3, the electron that you can locate in the third shell will be even further. Correct? So this is the reason why when n number increases, the size of your orbital must increase because the electron is found further away from the nucleus. So s orbital, I think it is pretty simple. Let's look at p orbitals. Now p orbitals, we have three of them for my p sub shell. We call them px, py, pz. So the x, y, z is a subscript. We put it after the p. So if let's say I'm drawing two p sub shell, the two p orbitals for my two p sub shell, one will be a two p subscript x. This is a two p subscript y. This is a two p subscript z. And for all of them, the shape is exactly the same. We call this a dumbbell shape. But to me, it looks like an infinity sign. So to me, my p orbital always looks like an infinity sign. So you can draw this infinity sign. Or if, you, if it looks like the number 8 to you, uh, also we can do that. It looks like a number 8, correct? So these three guys, the size is supposed to be the same. But the difference between them is they're pointing in different directions. So my 2px will be lying along the x-axis, left and right. My 2py will be lying along the y-axis, in and out. My 2pz will be lying along the z-axis, up and down. And when we draw p orbitals, because your p sub shell comes as a bundle, correct? My px, py, and pz will always come together. So when we draw p orbitals, usually we will draw all of them together. Very, very unlikely we are required to only draw one p orbital, only two px, but we don't draw y and we don't draw z. Huh? It's very unlikely we only draw two px, but we don't draw two py and we don't draw two pz. Very, very unlikely uh, to be the case. So it's like a McDonald's meal, huh? it comes as a bundle. You have a burger, you have fries, you have drinks. So everything must be together, correct? So when we draw p orbitals within your p sub shell, the idea is effectively the same. Usually we will have to draw them as one set and we put them on different axes so that it is not so cluttered. Usually we don't lump everything together because it will be very messy. Okay? So p orbital is pretty simple. Infinity sign pointing in different directions. Now we want to uh, have this discussion here because when we do presentation uh, when i draw my s orbital and my p orbitals we always draw them separate which actually also will give us a problem right of course in terms of presentation wise it looks nicer because they're all separated but relative to each other maybe the appreciation is not there so i think it's good to talk about it what if i merge everything together of course we never do this in presentation of our answer but what if i merge everything together i combine my 2s orbital and my 2px and my 2py and 2pz orbital, combine everything together, how would they look like? Which is a better representation of my 2s and all my 2p orbitals. Would it be something like this? Or would it look something like this? Which one looks nicer? Or which one looks more appropriate? 
Of course, nicer or not, it does, it's, it's not important, right? What is more important is the concept. So how do I consider which is the correct answer? Now, the difference between these two is the relative sizes of your S orbital versus your P orbital. This guy on the left hand side, the S orbital is smaller, the P orbital is bigger, correct? This one is the other way around. S orbital is bigger, the P orbital is smaller. And the size is related to where you can find the electron. Because if your orbital is bigger, then the electron can be located further away from the nucleus. If you're smaller, it means you're closer to the nucleus, and then the electron can be located closer to the nucleus. So that's the difference between these two. This one, 2s is smaller, closer to the nucleus. This one, the 2s is bigger. The 2s is further away from the nucleus. We have actually talked about this uh, previously. We have actually talked about this previously. If I consider 2s versus 2p, when I consider the subshell within each principal quantum shell, s is more stable than p, p is more stable than d, d is more stable than f. So if I compare 2s versus 2p, 2s is more stable, or it is closer to the nucleus. So therefore, it has to be smaller in terms of size. Because what we need to be able to show is, if I look at this guy here, if my 2s is smaller, and I put an electron here in my 2s, this electron is closer to the nucleus as compared to if I put an electron in 2p, this electron in my 2p is further away from the nucleus, correct? Which is consistent because if 2s is more stable than 2p, the electron in 2s should be closer to the nucleus, so therefore the attraction will be stronger and therefore it will be more stable, correct? So 2s more stable than 2p means that the 2s subshell or the 2s orbital has to be smaller and closer to the nucleus as compared to 2p. If you look at this version, uh, the other way around, if my 2s is bigger, it means that when I put the electron in, when I put the electron in 2p, I can find the 2p here with, with a certain distance from the nucleus. But when I look at the electron in 2s, I can actually put the electron in 2s here, which is actually further away from the nucleus, which you notice, uh, oh, if I look at this version, it's not really consistent with what we understand. We know that 2s is more stable than 2p, so therefore it has to be smaller than 2p so that the electron I can find in 2s is closer to the nucleus. This version is a lot better. Okay? Of course, again, usually in questions, we're not required to draw everything together, but in order for us to understand or appreciate the at least the relative uh, sizes of my 2s orbital versus my 2p orbital or s versus p orbital in the same principal quantum shell, I think it's good to have this discussion. Okay? Now, d orbitals. Now, d orbitals wise, uh, we have in total five of them. At the beginning, it might seem a bit uh, difficult, but in my opinion, because it is standard, so we just need to draw this a few times, we will be able to get the hang of it. All right, we have five of them, and we need to uh, be able to label each one of them. Now, in terms of shape, we have in total five of them. Four of them, the shape is identical. All right, we call this a clover leaf shape or four loop. So to me, it looks like a butterfly. Eh? This one is my butterfly. This is my butterfly. Altogether, we have four of them. There's one weird guy which looks quite different from the rest of them, but it's also quite easy to uh, recognize it. We will talk about this in a while. So the first set, usually in total, we need to draw five of them. Uh, but what I prefer to do is I like to draw them as three and two, two different sets. The first set that I prefer to draw is my x, y, y, z, and x, z. Now, this is one way of presenting. Some schools, what they do is they fix the axis. That means they fix the x-axis left and right, z up and down, y axis as in and out. Then they change the orientation of the orbitals. I think that way is a little bit harder because we need to keep changing how we draw the d orbitals. So if that's giving you a bit of a problem, then recommendation is you use this version because this version, which certain textbooks is using and some schools are using, Therefore, it is allowed, correct? If it is not allowed, then nobody will teach you that. So this is accepted in A-levels. It's just different schools have different preferences. Some of them will draw, fix the axis, change the orientation of the orbital. Some of us will draw, fix the orbital, change the orientation of the axis. In my opinion, this is a lot easier because when you draw the orbital, all look the same, all look like butterfly. Butterfly, butterfly, butterfly. So I'm changing the axis and if this is a D subscript, uh, x, y, then the axis will be x axis and y axis. It is just basically this butterfly loop uh, or this clover leaf shape D orbital. 
lying along the xy plane correct so this is my d y z so this is this clover leaf shape orbital or this butterfly orbital lying along the y z plane this is the same shape lying along the x z plane for my d x z so basically is this butterfly shape lying along different planes one will be like this one will be like this one will be like this again we don't really need to be able to visualize everything when we uh, look at them in 3D. So I think this version, it is a lot easier. And you notice the shape of your D orbitals in this case is a butterfly shape. So it looks like a cross, correct? Looks like an X. So let me just uh, show this here. This one looks like an X. Actually, all these are Xs. Huh? This is an X and this is an X. Now, if I compare this with the d orbital number four the fourth one that we want to draw dx square minus y square now dx square minus y square actually is also a butterfly the shape is exactly the same as all these guys but instead of an x what you do is you rotate this 45 degree clockwise or counterclockwise then it becomes a plus sign all right hopefully we're able to see that so instead of being an x this is now a plus sign but the shape is exactly the same as the first tree that we have drawn. We just rotate it 45 degree and we will have something like this. Now this is lying directly along the x, y plane. So we call this x square minus y square. d x square minus y square. So first of all, the shape is exactly the same. The size is exactly the same. So these are my four butterflies just pointing in different directions. Okay, we have one more weird guy, which is my dz square dz square to me always looks like a p orbital lying along the uh, z, uh, z axis and then there's a swimming float around the waist so it's like a p orbital learning how to swim uh, is having this swimming float around the waist or you can think of it as a donut so it's a donut around the waist but swimming float works better lah, huh? i think we can remember this better so this dz square of course looks significantly different from the rest of them Again, we don't need to care why this is the case. They do this by calculation, so this is the shape that they have. So we just make use of that, and we just apply this accordingly. Can okay? uh, usually I like to draw them as. Uh, so usually I like to draw them in this way. I like to draw this as three together and two together. Of course, the energy level for all five of them, they are exactly the same. They're degenerate. But the reason why I pair up or I split them up in this way is because d x square minus y square. And these x square, they are lying directly along the axis. This is along the x and y axis. This is along the z axis. Application wise for this, uh, actually comes much, much later when we do transition elements. When we do transition elements, actually this orientation becomes important, but we will talk about it much later because transition element is like the last topic in A-level chem syllabus. So usually we will do it right towards the end of A-levels. But application wise involving uh, orbitals, shapes of orbitals, S orbital, P orbital, we will use it straight away when we do chem bonding, chemical bonding, which is the next topic. When we try to draw sigma bond and when we try to draw pi bond, we will straight away use S orbital and P orbital and we try to show how do I form a pi bond, how do I form a sigma bond. D orbital application, we have mentioned, application comes a bit later when we do transition element, but we still get to apply this, but not so soon. All right? So in principle, what we need to know at this stage for this topic is we need to know how to draw the shape of my s orbital, which is spherical, p orbital, which is the infinity sign pointing in different direction. Uh, that's my p orbital. d orbitals would be all these four butterflies pointing in different direction, and this pz orbital with a swimming float around the waist. A pz orbital learning how to swim.